how we start to mobilize SMEs and organizations and companies at a more local level I and mean, how they're participating in driving and thus considering. In terms of introductions, the program director has already introduced who I am. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to um, get each one of our panelists to introduce who they are um, and to share some initial reflections around the opportunities that sit in the climate finance landscape. But we understand that climate is a huge driver for climate transition that I think the world is undergoing um, and that we need to be part of uh, as, a, as a country because this is where economic competitiveness is sitting. This is where the opportunities to include more of our people in the economy and really to realize the benefits of the economy are sitting. And so we would like this conversation to look at how we can practically start to move the individual businesses, the organizations that are implementing um, and developing new business models that will shape the economy of the South Africa of the future um, are actually going to be able to, to do so. So I'd like to hand over to our panelists to introduce themselves and to share their initial reflections on the kind of finance availability um, and how we start unlocking that and uh, understanding some of the gaps and opportunities that are sitting in that space. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Bosi Namba. Um, I am a transaction at Grand National Bank, which is one of the big commercial banks in South Africa. I previously, um, so before I joined RB, I studied in science, finance, and accounting at the University of Cape Town. I then did my honors in accounting at the University of Cape Town at Law. And I did my articles at QI post that qualifying as a trusted accountant. And thereafter, I had the opportunity to travel overseas um, to do some work in Switzerland. And I then um, got accepted to come back and work at Grand Merchant Bank. So that's where I've been. In Grand Merchant Bank, I work as, um, as a transactor in the infrastructure sector solutions team. So what we do there is we focus on everything infrastructure. Um, so that's triple P's and concessions. It's renewable energy and now private power. So renewable energy being um, your REAP or your public sector uh, projects. And we now focus on private power because of the, the, gener the, gener the generation license exemption that has now been um, put in place, which a lot of the speakers have gone into, a lot of people have gone so I won't dive into this. We also focus on oil and gas, um, and we also do equity transactions. This is something that people don't know much um, RMP also offers equity transactions, so equity financing. You need financing for equity, participation in participate in the project, you can finance that. And of course, if you need debt, um, primarily what we do. So enough about the team. Um, I think it's worth it in speaking about the difference between a commercial bank and a BFI, because I think that's very important for this, this panel, and it's very important for the education to understand that a commercial bank a bank that has shareholders, um, commercial bank has certain return expectations. Um, so it's not, it's not a bank that's willing to take basically the people that manage a bank the fiduciary duty to their shareholders to make sure that those shareholders get a certain return. In contrast to that, you then have your BFI. This is quite important to distinguish in the beginning. You have your BFI, which is your development finance institutions. Um, uh, Rudy mentioned one of them, AFE. We also have IBC, the DSA, all these kind of institutions that do finance and but they mandate is different from a commercial bank. The commercial banks like RMB, EFSA, Standard Bank, uh, Med Bank, they, they have different mandates and they have different return expectations versus those those kind of those kind of financial institutions. So to answer Che on reflections about um, what's happening in the climate in the climate environment right now. RMB has been involved with the reprogram since its inception, so back in 2011. And we've been financing, uh, we've been financing IPPs in that space. So in the, in the re renewable energy independent power procurement program, which is REAP, what you're doing there is you're financing an IPP, and the IPP is providing power to 
to to ESCOM, which is the, the utility of the country. So that's basically a transaction to finance say There's been a lot of rounds. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here as well because it's been covered before. So there's round one, round two, round three, round uh, three point five. There's round four, round five, which is which is just passed, and now we're kind of going to round six. What we've also seen is that because of the because of the gap uh, between how much energy we have and the mountain, so the, uh, the energy that is going to supply, we can mind, there's also an emergency power procurement program, which is the R M I P, which is a risk mitigation independent power procurement program. And as you all are uh, aware, that's sort of taken uh, that, that a score because uh, our partnership one of the players that won in that round took um, the DMRE to, to courts just to discuss or to to basically um, to to argue against uh, well actually sorry about that. So DNG, sorry, DNG, one of the players that was big but did not win took um, the car partnership to court because they, they felt that the reason why Papa should won that bid was because of um, untoward means for them to basically win that bid. So that's the RMI for P. It's kind of stalled. We are going back to conversation with the ITP to discuss the PPA, um, the PPA agreement, which is the power purchase agreement, and the implementation agreement. And then, so those are the transactions with, with um, the way ESCOM is applying. Now, what we've seen is the private power sector, uh, which I've already touched on. Where what we do there, we finance the IPP, or the, the IPP, which is the independent power purchaser. They basically procure power, and they construct and build. And with the power that is built and generated, they then sell that to an all taker. The all taker is a private party. So the difference is that you don't have this one as your all taker, you have a private party as an all taker. And there are some nuances there where you're looking at the REIT program, um, you, you notice that. The National Treasury will guarantee those transactions and say, okay, we'll be willing to back what this transaction is, versus in private power, you don't have a national uh, guarantee. So you have to take a view on the off taker to make sure that the off taker is able to, to purchase the power that you that you help the IPP generate or that you find it, the IPP to construct and, 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 um, and build a facility to generate electricity for the off taker. So I think those are the nuances. I'm not going to um, go into much detail now. But I think that's a landscape that we're looking at. We're looking at um, renewable energy, independent power procurement program, where the all-takers is now. We're now moving into a realm where the private sector is now involved. The private sector is both generating the electricity and the all-takers. So it's worth promoting those nuances. And um, I guess as R&D, we had to deal with those different risk metrics that you will get in the different programs. So I'll hand over to you, Jeff. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, good morning. I think it's early morning. My name is Jack Radmore. I'm the Energy and Climate Finance Program Manager for Green Cape. I've been in the organization for about seven years now and focus on one unlocking barriers within the energy sector, but are also within the climate finance landscape. I think we've had a two, two days of really exciting conversations. And, and I want to start by saying we, we, we've put a lot around the availability of capital. Previous speakers have spoken about the development finance coming from the north, 8.5 billion. My colleague here has spoken about what's available from some of our commercial banks. And more and more we're hearing about the availability of this finance. We've also heard about the really exciting projects and uh, companies that are starting up within the green economy. We've got three amazing examples here that find their home in Malanga. Electric vehicles being manufactured in the same world. We've got solar on a small scale. We've got energy storage. So what I'm really excited about for this discussion is to try to find how do we find the interconnection between those two spaces? How do we make sure the capital that's flowing into the country is flowing into the right structures uh, to find a home in these SMEs and projects that are looking for finance? So I'm really excited to see what this conversation draws and how do we start to move from the, the 10,000 feet all the way down into implementation on the ground and opportunities within that space. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, already, a lot of insight, and I think a uh, very interesting coverage of the landscape that we're working in. So, as Jack was mentioning, how do you start to make the linkages and bring in more um, capital where it's required? 
um, how do we make sure that we have enough capital in the space? And I think in the second part of the session, we'll focus a little bit more on um, how do we support those different actors and in particular SMEs um, to be able to access the level of finances that are already available. And then maybe thinking about the sorts of financial um, kind of products and interventions that we're introducing into the space to make it an ecosystem that is conducive. Um, I think to growth, but to growth that is also inclusive and, and is bringing in um, uh, uh, activity at a more uh, local scale. So perhaps I think just to, to give us a bit more insight into some of the opportunities that are available in the space, I'm going to go initially to, to Green Cape, um, who have been working um, over the past few years on understanding what's taking place, what are the opportunities we are in um, and also a, a sense of perhaps where some of those barriers uh, may, may be present that we need to address. Um, Jack, I'm going to hand over to you to kindly reflect on some of the work that you have been doing in this mapping space so that you get a sense of where the opportunities are sitting. And I think we have a really good collective as well um, to be able to start to address where some of those barriers will also be, will also be sitting. Thank you so much, Chair. Yes, yeah, so at the end of last year, or beginning of last year, we took a uh, climate finance mapping exercise. And the idea behind this is to try to understand the flows of climate finance all the way from their source uh, through the mechanisms which they're being dispersed all the way to the end of use. So, how are those funds ultimately being used within this African climate space? The idea behind this type of mapping is one, to understand those flows, but then also to start to identify the gaps and challenges. And within those flows. So we can quickly see once it is mapped, where are we missing key investments if we are to start to meet our NPCs, for example. This was very much the first baseline exercise, and we were able to track an annual investment of about 65 billion euro. It must be said that the tracking was undertaken outside of a REAP year, so the money would be a lot higher um, if there were REAP investments, but that 65 billion was flowing from international and local sources into the climate finance landscape. What we realized is that a large portion of that is coming from the, the private commercial sector, uh, about 60% of it. It is being done using mechanisms like commercial debt and equity. And it is also being focused on very much our later stage projects, the projects that are already developed and um, nothing in the earlier stage, and very much focused on renewable energy, a large portion of that flowing into the private sector. As our colleagues have said, a lot of uh, demand from the banking sector to move into that renewable energy as a, an established and well understood sector. But what it also highlights is the number of gaps. Right? So we saw gaps in early stage project development. So how do we help projects uh, across energy, water, waste, smart agriculture to move from a uh, concept phase through project development into a financial a lot of gaps in venture capitalist or uh, small SMEs, uh, almost non-existent. And a lot of gaps in the blended finance space. So how are we using public spending to really catalyze private sector spending in the sectors where we want to see a lot of impact? And that's specifically in education sectors. So in litigation sectors like renewable energy, understood commercial banks are really invested in there, they're lending in there, very little adaptation and adaptation spaces where we really are starting to a lot of work as we start to head into South Africa's kind of journey. So I think what this does allow us to see is a very nice mix of where are the opportunities for further investment, where are some of the gaps where we need to start to look at shifting our into institutional forms to addressing some of these gaps, and what we should be doing with public finance to try and incentivize the investment into specific. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, I think in the initial round of comments, we'll see um, you highlighted uh, some of those um, issues I think that you encounter in the financing of infrastructure projects, particularly in the energy space. Um, would you just kind of reflect on perhaps what are the, the key learnings that you've seen um, as you've participated in, in the REAP? Um, and perhaps to push it a little bit further, because there's an infrastructure focused conversation. Um, what lessons perhaps can we also be learning that we can apply other sorts of structure? And I'm thinking particularly around water, um, as, we, as we're also looking at the adaptation space. 
So if you just reflect perhaps on those key insights that you, you know, that you derived from this particular process that you've been involved in, and perhaps if you're able to just speak to some of those additional things that you can think of in the adaptation space as well when we're looking at infrastructure. So it's quite a lot that we learned as an energy bank in the space of the middle region, going back from week on one where the tariffs have been doing for an average 290 per kilowatt hours, and now it's averaging lower than one uh, per kilowatt what, per kilowatt hour, which again from when we have touched on yesterday that like the price. Uh, of the tariff that is charged to ESCOM and in these programs it has dropped drastically. And unfortunately with that there's a big drop in in so someone has to do that. So there's a big drop in equity returns. Um, and not just equity returns, even for senior lenders, because for us to enable our clients, which are the, the, the IPPs, to bid uh, competitive tariffs, um, we need to give them competitive pricing in the senior debt. So what is what we notice is that as the tariff goes down, so has the equity return for, for the IPPs. And the equity return is simply an equity IRR which says how much money you put in. Am I getting enough return on that money that I put in? And people have different return hurdles that they have to target. But in this energy space, there's some point where it's more than just returns, you have to do it for the social impact. What we've learned is that people are willing to lower the equity, uh, equity returns. So on that on that point, so what we saw in week round one was the equity return up to five percent, and not to five percent because the equity are another decreased to eleven percent. What you see in round five are people bidding at eleven percent equity IRs. Um, so those are the learnings. So those are some of the data points that we that we've seen as a bank. But in that, you know, our senior debt as well was priced at. Human child of us 50 years ago, but now it's going down to human child of us 30. So what we're seeing in the space is that for you, um, uh, or okay, not for you, but uh, for an IPP that wants to be competitive and um, for an institution that wants to play a role in the energy market, you should be willing to look past the returns and you should look to the social impact that has to be one of the big drivers. Um, and as you partner with financial institutions, you also have to um, go for competitive pricing, and in that, I mean, senior debt, and senior debt holders are only pushing each other, you know, because it's also a competitive uh, process for commercial lenders to fund. So we see that we also push each other to lower the pricing to see how far can we go down the senior debt um, to, to ensure that our clients obviously get their returns. What we've also learned, I mean, there are different programs, uh, and different programs have their own sets of documentation that you have to go through. Um, what I want to say here is that it's not a very simple process, you know, closing a financial transaction in the energy space, a lot of documents are most of you are a lot of documents that you have to go through, there's a lot of due diligence that you have to go through, and in that you need to understand what the risks are, um, because as commercial banks, as financiers, we want to know that, okay, the, you apply yourself as an equity holder or as an equity player in the, in the renewable energy space, you apply yourself to to, to what is possible with the site that I have, do I have a good connection, what are the limitations of the site, um, and how much, what is the target generation that I'm looking for? Am I looking to build a 100 megawatt plant? Am I looking to build more than that? And what are the implications there from a legal point of view? And um, so as you go through, as you participate in different programs, even as a bank, you need to understand what risk is in the room. Right? How, how, who, who are you, who are you liaising with in that? Um, who are you corresponding with? What are the documents looking like? What's the revenue model looking like? And the same thing with RMICO P. That has a different revenue stream itself. So you need to understand how is revenue generated today. Um, whereas in we we learned that in we you, you, you basically have a take or pay agreement with S1 as an IPP, uh, meaning that whatever we, whatever the IPP produces, is what S1 has to take or pay for it. And RMICO P is different in the sense that what you, what S1 is paying for there is the fact that you've made this capacity available for them. So that's what they pay for. They pay for the native capital capacity. And that's also different from the private power space. When you look at private power, the concepts where the concepts there where there can be penalties. So you're saying that you're gonna make a hundred megawatt plant, but if you're not achieving the capacity um, when you're supplying the electricity, the 
only penalties involved for you not to, for you not being able to provide the powers and IPP as a son. So those are different learnings and it's very um, it's very it's very it's very complex in a way, but once you once you start to navigate which program are you working in, uh, which space are you working in, uh, and of course have a have a strong partner from commercial banks that have done before. Um, if you have a strong partner, someone can advise you. It's very important to then work hand in hand with those people and understand what you're actually trying to achieve as an IPP. And then how can we the uh, second question is how can we then use these learnings in, in other assets or other asset classes like water treatment plants? Um, I think what you can do there is um, if you're going to be using project finance, understand what a project financier is looking for, especially if you're looking for funding. Um, I think you can go through all the risks and tick the boxes, but you always need to make sure that the financier is on board with you because these projects are very capital intensive. Um, you're looking at projects in REED, you're looking at projects in R4P. Um, even now in private power, that cost north of a billion rand. And so one project is costing north of a billion rand, which means that you require a lot of funding and you require a lot of gearing for you to get that return that you're looking for as a big player. So to do that, you need to make sure that you take the risk boxes that the financier will be looking for. Um, and in that, you can then apply that in whatever other transaction you're looking, you're looking at. So if you're looking for project financing, you can use what has been, what is basically the learnings that we've discussed now in the read, and private power. You can use that in other asset classes to see, okay, if it's project financing, what are the what, what are the risks um, and what's the return more importantly. And also just consider the I'm gonna speak from as 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 a commercial lender here, you have to consider the credit risk, you know. So a lot of people, a lot of um, players in the market, um, even some that are not in the market think that commercial lenders uh, and lenders in general, it's, it's, a, it's a point of just giving money away and not really looking for anything in return. But it's very important to know that money will be given, or money is usually is, um, given or advanced to people or IPPs or players that have proven their credit worthiness. So you need to take the risk of default. So there has to be minimal risk of default. And for projects like we and um, there's a track record. We know that the uptake is guaranteed by the National Treasury. But it's quite challenging to find into other projects like water treatments um, and other asset classes if you use the project finance as a, as a, as a voice of finance. If there aren't those guarantees in place or, or there aren't those mitigations that you find in renewable energy programs, it's difficult for a project financier to take a view on those kind of risks. And this, as, um, as the private party, you can prove that okay. um, we can provide a guarantee with a solid balance sheet behind this uptake, um, and then the project financier will take a view in that. So. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Nicole. I think um, you've spoken about the complexity of some of the um, transactions that are taking place in the space. Um, and I think you've mentioned quite a lot about risk, um, which is a key issue when you're dealing with emerging technologies, but also with companies uh, trying new and innovative business models of how we can roll out these products and services in the South African market. And then I think you've also spoken to quite a number of different instruments um, in, in how we can deal with, with the level of risk, but how we can also understand the different forms of value are coming from projects. So you're getting returns, but projects also have an impact on the community and on those who are deriving the value from, from the products and services uh, that are being provided. So I think maybe to, to, to link that to, to Jack in particular, um, we know the launch of this new cluster um, has spoken to, to the importance of having partnerships in place. I think to deal with the level of complexity in some of these transactions, um, but also to use those partnerships to enable more inclusion and the full use of some of the tools that we have available to us. Uh, South Africa is a top-rate financial system and financial sector. Um, perhaps reflecting on how we can mobilize the different actors that are sitting in that space to come together to respond to the issues that we have around risk and to respond to the issues about how do we derive social benefit and value um, from this emerging economy and really 
and start to see those opportunities play out um, in the South African landscape. Thank you so much, Ruth. I think it is a really important question. Um, and the idea about partnership is as important in the new cluster as it is in uh, finance and effective use of finance with infrastructure. And this is the, the basis for the concept of blended finance. It's the ability of using public funds to catalyze uh, private sector investments into specific sectors where we want to see an impact. I think our colleagues from Groundwork and from their amazing effort in the just transition highlighted that. So how do we better use our public funds to really try and catalyze investment from the private sector into sectors that are perhaps new, slightly more risky, or, or less understood than the, the current um, structures or sectors that are understood. I think my colleague from RMB mentioned two really important points. Firstly, that um, there is limited risk appetite in the commercial lending space. Right? You need to meet a number of risk criteria before they're willing to lend. It was mentioned that return requirements are being squeezed uh, and more and more we're trying to bring our prices down, but that return requirement remains from a commercial lending point of view and from a fiduciary responsibility to, to shareholders. The concept of blended finance has the ability to address those two concerns. Right? If we're able to add any concessional elements into our financing to partner with commercial lenders, we can help to de-risk projects. We can help to bring the risk outside from the commercial lender to a higher point because they've got that concessional finance at their back. We're able to uh, bring down their return requirements because they've got that concessional financing at their back. We're also able to bring our financing into the earlier stage of the project development life cycle. So starting to look at that pre-financing requirements, project inception, all the way through to, to financing. So I think that the use of strategic blended finance is extremely important in the future, not only the South African green economy as a whole, but the just transition particularly. Chair, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'd love to give some examples of current blended finance facilities that are happening. We heard last night at the launch of the cluster that the green economy is not a futuristic thing anymore. What's happening right now? And we've heard about this 8.5 billion that's been uh, promised. We won't say committed yet, but there, there's actual implementation happening on the ground right now. The first I want to highlight is the Green Outcomes Fund. The Green Outcomes Fund is the first of its kind. Uh, investment fund that's looking to incentivize private sector investors to invest in SMEs that can achieve specific green outcomes. Again, it's, it's a blended finance facility that's incentivizing private sector commitment into the right sector where we want to see an impact. Through a partnership with the National Jobs Fund, uh, a 100 million rand grant has catalyzed 400 million rand in private sector funding into green sectors. That's a drop in the ocean, but a massive opportunity uh, in the longer run. We've also seen a really exciting agricultural blended finance facility through a partnership with national governments and the IDC. And that's a one billion rand fund that's been made available to small scale agriculture setups. That one billion rand was five times oversubscribed within the first round. So it really is a massive demand for this type of finance that brings down that risk that brings the project financing slightly earlier and is able to support from a return perspective. So I'm really excited to see how we continue to grow and find those partnerships between public finance and private finance. Thank you very much for those insights. I think we're, we're nearing the close of this particular session. But before we close, we'd like to reflect a little bit more on the other side of this equation. So you need finance to be available uh, in the landscape to be able to implement different initiatives. But you also need the SMEs, the companies, to be able to absorb uh, the finance and to be able to access it. So perhaps just to reflect very quickly on some of the work that we've been undertaking with the UK on an initiative called the Green, Fin the Green Finance Accelerator. And this is really an initiative that's targeting companies, SMEs that are active in providing the services and the products that characterize the new economy um, and, and building their capacity and ability to be able to access some of the, the financial resources that are sitting in the space. And we're really focusing on how do we hone 
uh, their ability, I think, to speak the same language as the financial sector, but also to be able to articulate their bank position um, in the form of all the documents um, that we just referred to that are so necessary to be able to access um, the, the, the finance that is actually available to us. And I think one of the key things to reflect on as well is where many of these initiatives are sitting that are trying to get more activity from local SMEs and organizations into the space. Um, that the project size in our particular uh, initiative is sitting um, in excess of about 140 million rands. Um, so just to start reflecting on how we are able to transfer skills and the ability to what are often proven uh, business models to be able to access these various uh, financial opportunities and to start scaling up the economy, creating jobs, but also transferring the means of generating wealth to uh, the broader South African population as they participate more and more um, in the opportunities that are offered by the green economy um, and transitioning to a low carbon and a resilient economy. Um, I think in addition to just also reflecting and, and giving some of your closing remarks on this on this topic, uh, if you possibly just share what some of the initiatives that are is running, that are building the pipeline that's needed to, to actually shift our economy um, and perhaps to, to Green Cape and to Jack, to just share uh, perhaps a little bit more on what you're doing to support the ability of kids uh, and East to actually access the finance and to absorb the size um, of finance that's often offered by these different uh, organizations and resources. So, on R&D side, what we focus on is um, providing funding, so making sure the finance is there. Um, we try to support our clients as much as we can in whatever RFP that um, becomes available to the market, um, be it in private power, be it in, even with the, the uh, initiative that is running now in Bimalang with the land piece. Project RB has availed itself and has supported a few of those things in terms of the outcome. And we provided it as a support um, to those to, to go back to peace, saying, listen, whichever RP comes out, RP is always going to use finances. Um, especially, with, obviously, the clients that we work with, um, we're always interested and happy to meet other, other different clients that we don't work with. Um, it's just that in the space with commercial banking, it's very difficult. Um, to 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 find new clients because usually what you end up doing is people can dash to EFSA and dash to Maybank. Um, but R&B is available, so that's something that we can do out there. What we also do is we finance equity transactions, which is something I spoke about in the beginning. That's very important because a lot of the players in the market don't have access to funding. But what you typically do is we provide senior gates and the IDP will be a global IDP, which is Big company is able to take on these transactions, and you have small players in, in the South African market that want to participate, but they don't have access to funding to participate. So even if it's a PE role, it's also a PE player or as a community trust, and if you still work on solutions, they will be able to find community trust as well. We work on solutions around that, but the PE financing, we offer equity terms for a black economic um, empowered. SPD or company that wants to participate in those renewable energy transactions, we provide financing for these. It's very attractive terms. What we've done is that we even refinance some of the transactions um, in the earlier rounds where PE players had unfavorable terms, where you participate in the equity player, which gives you the terms maybe 10 years after the project has been operational, which obviously shatters your equity IR. And you're spending most of that time repaying the loans. So RB is done to come up with certain equity instruments that enable us uh, to finance these equity these big, uh, players so that they see their money back front. They don't see their money back in, they see their money with the equity player or the big sponsor that they're partnering with in the equity in the renewable energy transaction. It's quite important um, to, to say that that's how we are locking for the um, SMEs. Of course, even those players. Uh, up there around one, around one that we participate in now, it's around five. Those SMEs go to become their own big corporations, and we we proud to partner with people like that. So if if you if you are an SME and 
you, you want to go into space, you should consider some of these, some of these solutions that aren't the others. Um, I also wanted to touch on... Right, thank you. I'll hand over to Chad for now. Um, but yeah, it's basically it. Um, RMP is always available to Oka. So something that I actually did, so I just remember now what I want to say is that um, in the space, uh, the limitations around gearing, right? you want to give your returns as an equity player, a lot of limitations around how much gearing you can raise. Right? So some people, some banks are 70, 80%. So back in around wine, it was 70% gearing, and now that's increased to 85 to 90%. And so RMP is one of the banks that's pushing that they need to say, okay, let's relook at the way we look at this. Let's relook at the, the way we look at the ratios that we, that we, that we get into our countries. So we're pushing down some of the DSR, DSRs that you we'll look at, some of the ratios, we're working on lowering those, so that the equity share can have some space in the beginning of the energy project, then you remove the energy project, to play around with those cash flows and make sure um, that they're getting the returns and the energy to pay for the operating expenses. So things like gearing, uh, pricing of our debt, and, and those kind of metrics, we work on those so that the players uh, can have an opportunity. And we also work on our equity financing. So that's, uh, that's one of the key takeaways that I want to uh, uh, have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair. I think I just want to quickly speak about that support to SMEs and projects. You mentioned the CFA. I think in the first round we had 140 applicants, so, so a really significant pipeline of projects looking to work in the climate finance space. We're about to go out on our second call for the second year uh, for applicants that would like support to accelerate themselves to the point of being ready to take on finance. So please keep an eye out for that call. Um, we've also just had uh, the completion of the fifth annual Green Pitch Challenge. In that, we had more than 130 applications across seven different sectors. The winners there, uh, the one was doing um, from a wood extract of producing a UV protection that they're putting into sunscreen and into building materials. That's a local company innovating, first of its kind around the world. The other company is bringing in uh, electric minibus taxis for the first time in South Africa. They have a really strong business case. And on the back of the Green Pitch Challenge, the first three minibus taxis will be landing in South Africa in July. This means there is a significant opportunity. There's a great pipeline of projects within the climate finance landscape that are looking for financing. And it's really exciting to see how do we continue to build that momentum? How do we make sure that pipeline is ready to take on this kind of finance? How do we make sure that our commercial lenders are looking at the right pipeline and that are designing the mechanism for investment that match with that pipeline? I think I'm going to allow a closing statement before we wrap up. What I wanted all us to is to remember the, the sort of person on the ground that's looking to implement climate uh, kind of adaptation or mitigation. I met a lady last night who owns a poultry farm here locally. How do we make sure that when we're designing climate finance mechanisms that she has a credit facility that she can access to put biogas on her plants on a, on a farm to bring down her costs? How do we make sure the manufacturer of that electric vehicle in the back corner there has a credit facility that can draw down onto? To produce electric land cruisers for every single uh, game park in the summer market. That's what I want us to remember. Design our climate finance mechanisms with the end user in mind. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panelists and panelists for giving us a few more minutes just to wrap up. Um, I think we've heard about the scale of opportunities that are sitting in the space. And I've mentioned before, we have a world-class financial system. I do believe we have the levels of innovation um, and the willingness to do the hard work that's sitting um, at, at ground level um, to get those initiatives up and running and to get communities, to get SMEs, to get companies truly involved in being able to deliver um, this new economy um, that is inclusive. I think that allows us so many opportunities to be those who are generating um, wealth and are including others in how we're structuring and transitioning this economy. Um, I think we have a great opportunity to put in place the different institutions that can make up the ecosystem that's required to be able to cater for those who are smaller in nature, um, but to enable them as well to grow their own economic 
entries and, and the benefits that come with that. Thank you very much to our panelists and for your attention um, today.